Hello, and welcome to the No BS Debates with two of the candidates for City Council District 10. We are your moderators. My name is Dela Vaca. And I'm Sarah Moore. We want to thank the candidates for coming out to represent their communities. We also want to thank Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, uh, for participating in the democratic process. The debate rules go as follows. We as the moderators will ask the individual candidates questions on the topic of civil rights and, re and other related issues. The candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer, after which the other candidate will have the opportunity to rebut for one minute. The first candidate will have the opportunity to reply. We encourage a lively debate, but we will interrupt you if someone goes too long. The debate is slated for 50 minutes, and as we draw into the last 10 minutes, we will end the debate and push into the lightning round. At this time, the candidates will be asked closed-ended questions, um, and you will reply with either a yes or a no, okay? Denver City Council District 10 is located in central Denver and serves the diverse neighborhoods of Belcaro, Capitol Hill, Cherry Creek, Chesman Park, Civic Center, Congress Park, Country Club, North Capitol Hill, and Spear. The district has been called a tale of two cities. Candidates for District 10 are Christopher Hines, Antonio Mendez, Tony Smith, and our incumbent Wayne New. There's also a writing candidate named Patrick Key. Today we have Mr. Hines and Antonio Mendez and we will begin with Mr. Mendez for your one and a half minute introduction. Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Today, I look forward to a lively debate. Uh, my name is Antonio Mendez, and I'm a candidate for Denver City Council District 10. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience in uh, government and education. I've been a Fulbright Scholar. I've been Deputy Chief of Staff to two Lieutenant Governors, Lieutenant Governor Joe Garcia and Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn. But more important than all that, I am a neighbor. I am a resident in the community, and I realize there's a number of issues that's affecting both our community and the city of Denver writ large. So aside from infrastructure issues, housing issues, uh, transportation issues, we also have a representation issue in Denver. Unfortunately, the current incumbent only seems to be interested in representing the interests of the wealthy in our district, and I think we need a representative who will represent the entire district and the many nuances that uh, make up all of its different neighborhoods. So I'm excited to, for, to attend this debate and, and to participate. Thank you so much. Mr. Hines. Uh, also, thank you very much for having us here. My name is Chris Hines, and I'm a candidate also for Denver City Council District 10. Um, I'm, I, I grew up in rural Texas, an only child of a single mom. Uh, my dad never graduated high school. Uh, my mom cleaned houses growing up. And I was very fortunate to be the first in my family to get a scholarship to go to college. I went to Southern Methodist University. Um, my mom's a hippie. So um, how do you rebel against a hippie mom? I went into corporate America. So I ended up getting a computer science degree from SMU. And then I went back to SMU and got an MBA in finance. Uh, and I came to Colorado the, for the same reason a lot of people come to Colorado, for the rugged outdoor lifestyle. And, um, and in, I, I came here in 2007. And in, the, in that time, I've seen that there's been a lot of development in the city. And, um, and, and m many people would say that that rugged outdoor lifestyle is at risk here in the city. So um, I'm here uh, running on three things. Um, we all need access. We all need access to housing. We all need access to transportation. And as Antonio mentioned, we all need access to representation. So thank you very much. I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. So we'll get started with our first question here. Um, some information first. Denver will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from city-mandated property seizures and camping bans that leave officers confiscating properties in all kinds of weather conditions. This is a city authorized police action, which leaves the unhoused facing any number of adverse health outcomes, including an up to death, and which also deprives them of their personal property. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? We'll start with you. Uh, so I am against Initiative 300, and this, is, this will actually be part of the lively debate. 
um, I, I'm against Initiative 300. Um, I'm also against the camping ban. Um, if we had just, if Initiative 300 was just to repeal the camping ban, then I would be all for it. And I believe the residents in District 10 would be for it as well. Um, there are other things that go beyond um, uh, repealing the camping ban. Um, I actually um, had issues getting here from, uh, from my home in North Capitol Hill because there were, um, uh, there were things in the sidewalk. Uh, there was a shopping cart and a whole bunch of uh, belongings in the sidewalk, so I had to go around. Um, I certainly, I believe that I'm very sympathetic to our homeless. I actually, um, when I was little, we lived out of a car for a while. We lived out of a church for a while. Um, and uh, so I never had the opportunity to live on a street, um, but I certainly did not have a house for a while. Um, we need to put resources into making our, um, our uh, giving our homeless homes. Uh, housing first policy is the, is the right answer. Uh, call, that's the answer that Colorado Coalition for the Homeless supports. Um, they support a five-point plan, and, um, and I support that plan as well. I think it's also important for us to, uh, to make sure that we have um, uh, full wraparound services with, those, with that Housing First policy as well. So thank you. Mr. Mendel, please. Thank you. Um, so I am in favor of Initiative 300. Uh, and I'll start off in first the legal aspect of it, and then we can get to the personal. Um, legally speaking, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has already struck down a similar camping ban in Idaho, um, and it's been affected or, or throughout the entire Ninth Circuit. It's only a matter of time before a case goes to the Tenth Circuit and that gets struck down here. It's a clear violation of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, the cruel and unusual punishment. It is cruel and unusual um, to lock someone else up because they don't have a place to live, to criminalize poverty. That is completely cruel and unusual. So that's the legal side of it, and that'll happen eventually. Personally speaking, my father was homeless when he came to this country for the first year. We lived in New York. He slept on the A train for an entire year. If a similar policy had been in place in New York, he would not have been able to go to college because he probably would have been arrested for sleeping in a public space. Um, and I would not be where I am today. Why are we making it more difficult for people to rise out of their circumstances? Uh, while many say that the proposition or the or initiative as written is too broad, um, city council can actually amend that afterwards, similar to the Green Roof Initiative. This is not a be-all, end-all. Um, I also want to say, you know, this is a very polarizing issue, and both sides of the debate truly care about our community, but I think we need to see the homeless for what they are, which are neighbors and human beings, and not see them as inconveniences. Thank you. Thank you. Two. Really quick, can I jump in? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hines, you used an anecdote about your travel here uh, and mentioned an obstruction on a sidewalk that was a homeless person's belongings and a shopping cart. Uh, the, the camping, I'm sorry, Initiative 300's text reads uh, non-obstructive manner. So what you experienced wouldn't be in compliance with Initiative 300. You also said that you supported the repeal of the camping ban. What Initiative 300 does is repeal the, ca uh, the camping ban, but then also codify it into law so it can't be challenged again. Um, at what point do you think that people are going to block sidewalks permanently and that will be legal? Um, so the challenge, uh, so, and, and thank you for um, calling me on my BS. Um, so the challenge is uh, if it were just repealing the camping ban, that would be, I, I think you know, it would pass with a considerable margin. Um, there's vague language in, um, uh, in Initiative 300. For example, the, the definition of public space is vague. Um, the, uh, and our laws are no better than the words crafted, um, uh, used to craft the laws. And don't we want legislators that are very semantic? And so it's really wonky, but the definition of public space has an or in it. And one side of def the definition of public space says outdoor. And then there's another side of the definition of public space that doesn't include that. And so it's, that's, um, uh, that's what Antonio had mentioned about broad or vague. Um, if we could tighten up that definition, that'd be great. The concern, though, is that city council can't touch it for six months. There's a moratorium with this uh, vague language for six months. Our constitution is vague. Our laws should be black and white. Um, there shouldn't be any room for interpretation so that one police officer knows it, the exact same interpretation as another police officer. So our law should be black and white. And that's, that's my concern about Initiative 300. And I think that's the concern of many neighbors and residents about Initiative 300. So let's go back to Mr. Mendez, but by way of a caveat, 
the argument that we need housing first is a strong argument. People yeah. deserve homes. But the amount of time it takes to build a home, the amount of cost that goes into it, and transitioning these folks from homelessness into a, into a home is, is, a, is on a timeline that forces them to stay in the streets until that's completed. Uh, and the Campy Ban is saying you can't exist in the streets. Uh, respond to Mr. Hines and to that argument. To Mr. Hines' previous point about... Yeah, please. Okay, so again, I think I said earlier in my statements that city council could address it. He said six months. I think that six months is more than fine. Um, we've had four years of a camping ban, and in that time we've had numerous um, incidents between the police and the homeless. Uh, so I would wait those six months if I knew I could eventually fix the language and make it so that you wouldn't criminalize poverty. So I'll start there. Um, as for the um, housing first policy, I don't think it's a, I think it's a false choice here between housing and or decriminalizing camping. I think you can do both. And I think you've heard from every city council race, regardless whether it was at large, um, one through uh, ten, or the mayoral race, you've heard folks say, we need more housing, we need more affordable housing, and not just for the homeless, but also for those of us who are living check to check. Right? This is a city that's quickly becoming unaffordable. Um, so I, I reject the notion, and I call BS on that question, there isn't a choice between the camping ban or housing first policy. So let's move on to the next question. Sure. Racial equality and equity remain a nationwide concern. A few facts. Colorado had the most extensive KKK network west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of, of one just ran for governor this past year. Uh, a neighborhood and an airport are named after him. Educational equity has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues unabated. The Denver Gentrification Study from 2016 argues that gentrification is premised on a view of space as profit margin and not necessarily community. Mm -hmm. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial wealth gap in Colorado, they said, the latest view of racial and income inequality in the US shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Colorado was also third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. White terror and uh, right wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans, yet people of color suffer the brunt of policing. There's a lot of issues in there. What are your thoughts on racial equality and equity, and how will you work to move District 10, and by extension Colorado, towards a more equal and equitable future? We'll start with Mr. Hines. Me again. Um, so I would, I, I only have a minute and a half to answer, so I'll just quickly plug the Colorado Black Women for Political Action. Um, I was named a Colorado Black Women for Political Action champion, and um, I would reference that um, questionnaire. The questionnaire responses are online. Uh, because it goes, I go into quite a bit more detail about um, uh, our conversations about our communities of color. Um, district 10 is white. Um, it's uh, the the people who vote in District 10. Um, uh, the the dominant ethnicity is is Caucasian. The second of uh, of people who are frequent voters is unknown. That's how white the district is. However. Um, Denver City Council's District 10 representative votes in every issue throughout the city. And, and you're right, um, there's, a, there's a long history of um, racial profiling. There is a neighborhood that's, that's named after a Klan member. And um, uh, I've been asked before if I support renaming that neighborhood, and I do. Um, I, I, I happen to be a white male who grew up in rural Texas. Uh, there was a gentleman who was dragged to the, dragged, he was chained behind a truck and dragged to his death just because of the color of his skin, and that was less than an hour from where I grew up. Um, I have learned a lot about um, people who say no um, in, the last, um, uh, in the last 10 years now that I am also part of a protected class, and I'll talk about, more, uh, talk about that more, I guess, later. Sure. So I'll start off by talking about the work I did under Lieutenant Governor Joe Garcia and why narrative is so important. So initially in the Department of Higher Education, we thought that there was this thing called the Colorado Paradox. The Colorado Paradox was this idea that we do an amazing job of importing really smart people from other states with degrees, but we do a terrible job of educating our own. So a state demographer did a report and actually it turns out we do a really great job of educating our white folks. That's about the same rate as every other state, about 55%. We do a terrible job with our African-American and Latino populations. 
So Lieutenant Governor Garcia not only led initiatives to make it so that nine, now just nine out of 100 um, Latino high school students went to college and actually completed college in the state, um, but also that the narrative changed because if we're not focusing on the right issue, we're not coming to the right solutions. I think that's true across all different issues. I think it's really important to really assess what truly is going on. Um, as far as Stapleton Airport, and let's call it Stapleton Neighborhood, Stapleton Airport, why are we not saying the person's name? Um, I'm in favor, completely in favor for renaming that. Um, I do think it's important for historical wrongs to be made right. You know, I worked for Governor Hickenlooper and I was incredibly impressed when he, alongside three other governors, actually apologized for the Sand Creek Massacre. It took, it took a lot of courage to do that when governor after governor previously had rejected the notion. It meant a lot to the Ute Mountain Indians and the Southern Ute. Um, I think we need to do more of that healing, but I think we need people to bring folks together. Um, and I think when you start accusing folks and automatically calling them racism or racist, people close their ears immediately. Mr. Hines, a response? Or did you want to continue your comments from earlier? Um, so, I, yeah, so growing up as a white male, I would like to continue. So growing up as a white male in rural Texas, I didn't have any issues. And this wheelchair has taught me a lot about uh, being part of a protected class. It's, turned, it's taught me a lot about how people tell me no now. And I'm not used to, you know, I wasn't used to that. And I'm not trying to say that um, suddenly I understand communities of color because I um, was in a, a, an injury, or I have an injury, but, um, uh, but certainly it makes me far more sensitive to, uh, to reaching out to various communities and, um, and far more open and receptive. Another thing that I would say is um, travel has helped me as well. Um, uh, when I first, you know, when I grew up in rural Texas, um, people spoke Spanish and it's part of the, you know, the culture, right? Um, the white culture in rural Texas is that people who speak Spanish are the help or they do your dishes or whatever. Well, I played soccer growing up and, um, and I traveled as well. And I went to, I've been to Venezuela, Peru, Chile, Costa Rica, and I'm not trying to say that that makes me a great person as well, but I discovered that there were people who owned businesses, who uh, ran pharmacies, and uh, they didn't speak English at all. And that's certainly a, a, a huge wake up call for me. And I think it's important for us to continue that journey and to spread that knowledge to, to others. Can I push back on something he said? Please do. Thank you. Um, so he said that the majority of the neighborhood is white. And that's true right now. But that may not be true in the future. Um, and unless we do a lot more to help our communities of color with that um, wealth income disparity, that, can, that community is going to continue being white. It's going to continue having uh, white representatives who only, unfortunately, are looking out for some um, of those interests. You know, we have uh, a huge gap. Uh, in that neighborhood in terms of the, uh, the affordability of a house. My wife and I, we occasionally go looking for a house to live in our own district. You cannot find anything under half a million dollars um, for a house. You know, we currently own a condo and we're very fortunate to do that. Uh, but a lot of folks don't even see our community as a possibility for them. So why would, why would things change? They wouldn't under that current logic. Thank you. Were we done with that question? Yes. Okay. Did you have I was going to just push back a little bit. Mr. Hines was talking about how white the community is, and it is, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, and you also pointed out that we can't always have white representatives. We talked about uh, Wayne New, our incumbent, not being here today. Wayne New uh, doesn't have a website, and appears he's feeling very confident in his chances. He does have a website. It's a different website, new website. Um, he also raised eleven thousand dollars from special interests, yeah. and he uh, tends to hang out apparently in country club neighborhood, uh, which is one of the wealthier ones. Um, it also reeks a little bit of tokenization to think that traveling to communities of color or countries of color could suggest anything that looking outside of your windows or community uh, wouldn't also suggest. I wonder how we move past that idea of. I mean, do we, do we need to send all white people in America on a, on a voyage of discovery to understand racism? Or can, can we expect you as a community to figure it out? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, d taking a, tour, a trip around the world isn't going to work for some people. It's not going to, I mean, a voyage of discovery, I, I think, is smart for everyone. Uh, for everyone to get um, to s smarter about the people around them. Um, you, I think that's uh, a fair pushback to say that um, just by traveling to various countries, I mean, you know, that doesn't 
I could, I could also watch them on television and watch the Travel Channel for a little while back when they actually had shows about travel. And, um, and that doesn't make me a, a more understanding person. I would say that, um, uh, that I've made a concerted effort to reach out even in our own communities. Like just last Friday, I went to Jerryville, um, which is our homeless uh, tent community at 27th and Arapahoe. And I talked with Mayor Jerry and I want to understand, you know, the Initiative 300 issue is the most difficult issue, I believe, in, um, in our city politics. And it's important for, for me to get a well-rounded view. So I went and visited with them. And, um, and there was a homeless uh, sweep from Jesus Saves. And those, uh, that group is now joining Jerryville. And, and it's not copacetic. They're not working well together. And so um, it's also interesting that not only are there... Um, disparate communities, but like one homeless community isn't working well with another homeless community. Can I? Or We're we... going to move on to the next question. Okay, perfect. So April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I'm going to start with some uh, statistical facts here. So one in five women and one in 71 men in the United States have been raped at some time in their lives. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads have been sexually assaulted. CU is currently in the news for a recent rape. Denver's DA, Beth McCann, uh, was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of rape cases, only a small improvement over her predecessor, um, her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post rape tracker shows that Denver has had 185 assaults reported so far this year, uh, which is an average of 54.1 per month, that's 1.8 per day, which is up from 122 when we even began this debate series. The most rapes in any, in any neighborhood in Denver has, ha has had this year um, is five points with 16, which is up from the number nine. Uh, the average number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 2.37, which is increased from 1.56 from only a few weeks ago. These numbers are staggering, and the number of rapes since uh, these numbers are staggering, and the numbers of rapes just since we be began these debates. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female identified bodies? We'll start with you, Mr. Sure. Um, I'll start off by saying those numbers are wrong in that they don't represent the entire picture. These are people who are actually coming forward and saying they've been raped. A large population remains that doesn't, because uh, circumstances, whatever those might be, don't actually come forward and say, I've been sexually molested or raped. Um, so I'll start by saying the problem is worse than we think it is already. Um, to start off, I think the role of the city council person is to listen to groups who've organized around this issue and to their proposed solutions, um, to convene folks, so all the disparate parts of the, the city government, um, so that's the Department of Human Services, that's the police, um, that's Denver Health, uh, et cetera, um, to, to focus on issues that we can collaboratively come together to do. Um, and then I think finally is to be a champion, is to be the person who um, can come out and say this is wrong and we need more funding and more awareness around the issue. Um, I think unfortunately a majority of our city doesn't know the statistics that you just mentioned. Um, I think that would shock many people. I think folks view Colorado as a safe place, so to hear that that kind of harm is happening within our community might shock a lot of people. Um, but so I think we need to do a lot more. Um, Mr. Hines. I want to thank you because I, I didn't know. I didn't, th these, these statistics are telling and compelling and very troubling. Um, and uh, uh, what can we do as a, as a city council person? Well, the sheriff's um, department reports up to the mayor. The police department reports up to the mayor. Um, so you're right. It's, it's that, I think that's a valid question. And the important thing that, the, that city council has or each city council person has is a voice. Um, has access to the media, as in organizations like yours, and um, and has closer access to uh, to reporters. And I think um, it is important for us to get that out. Um, it is important for us to realize that we cannot, um, as one sex, 
dominate another sex just because uh, because we feel like we can or because of um, you know uh, history or whatever it's important for us to um, to use our position as a megaphone and um, and to use you know Antonio's uh, a word be a champion on behalf of um, all communities that are underserved, including those who um, have stepped forward and those who uh, feel uncomfortable even stepping forward. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I would just say that um, you know this issue affects all women, but I, I want to be mindful also of. Um, mm, vulnerable women, marginalized women. So I'm thinking specifically of my time as um, a law student when I went up to a Mikasa clinic and I heard someone tell me, listen, I'm having issues with my husband and he sexually molested me multiple times, but I'm undocumented. And so I don't want to go to the police. Who do I turn to? And just struggling to find a lawyer or anyone who would give that person an answer. Um, so I think we need to do more with our laws to make it um, safer for all folks to report um, their violation and their assault um, and to remove things like immigration out of, out of this equation. Quick question. Uh, you're correct that the majority of rapes go unreported. It's about 60% go unreported. How uh, do you have that number? That said, it's not enough to have outrage, right? Um, specific plans need to be in place, specific ideas. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sarah presented in her question was that Beth McCann has only been able to prosecute 30% uh, of the rapes that are brought to her. Uh, what is the breakdown from collection of evidence from law enforcement to prosecution, right? How do we fix it? Who exerts power uh, over those systems and what can the city council do? What can you do as city council members to address that? Yeah, well, again, I call it BS on your first statistic of 60%. You're saying 60% of an unknown number is an unknown number. And so Fair. if folks aren't reporting it, folks aren't reporting it, you can't measure that. So I'll start there. Um, secondly, around Beth McCann, 30% are being prosecuted. I'd like to see how many are either um, some kind of settlement uh, or agreement that they'll serve this amount, they'll be registered as sex offenders, et cetera, versus just not being um, followed through at all. It might also be that the person later says, I'm withdrawing, I'm refusing to testify against this person, I'm refusing to press charges. Um, that doesn't exempt you know, DA McCann from um, doing what she needs to do in terms of increasing those numbers. But I think we as a community need to make a safe space for those folks to come forward and not have to fear retribution and not have to fear what will happen in their lives. Just to throw it out before you respond, uh, the 60% of assaults go unreported number comes from the Denver's Blue Bench, which is uh, one of the best rape prevention groups in the country. I, I worked for them for about six months doing this kind of work. But I appreciate your feedback on that. Sure. Mr. Hines. Um, so I think it's important for us uh, as a city to make sure that we have the appropriate resources. So like, what can we do as a city council? Um, we can make sure that we provide uh, proper funding for rape kits. Um, as, we under as I understand it, um, Denver Police has a policy to retain all rape kits. Um, we can also make sure that we have the proper funding to, um, to actually test those rape kits. Um, sometimes uh, various organizations or, or departments um, are, have a huge backlog on rape kits. So we can make sure that we have uh, the appropriate resources uh, to make sure that they're tested uh, within a re uh, you know, reasonable time frame. What is, what is that time frame? I don't know, um, 24 hours, seven days. Um, so certainly that's, some, that's a way we can help. Thank you for your, for your thoughts on that. Uh, the next question tonight is gonna to be on community wellness. According to denverpublichealth.org city council report for district 10, uh, district 10 life expectancy is 79.1 years, 0.5 years longer than the overall, 78.6 for Denver. Uh, differences in life expectancy uh, between districts show that place matters. 20% uh, of district 10 young adults 18 to 24 use tobacco, 3% higher than Denver overall. 7% of public school children, 2 to 17 in district 10 are obese, which is 9% lower than Denver overall, and 14% of District 10 adults have been diagnosed with depression, which is about average. Uh, the average is 13 for the city. Denver.gov states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, healthy food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to those allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive. Do you believe District 10 is serving this community equitably in these areas? And if not, what will you do to address disparities 
in the district. We'll go back to Mr. Mendez. Sure, sure. So the social determinants of health, which you discussed, I think is incredibly important. Um, I think there are some things that you're not measuring there that I think are incredibly important. So for example, the quality of air in the city um, is uh, abysmal comparatively to what it should be. Um, I think Chris and I will actually agree on that point. Um, so, you know, we talk often about the access to parks and public places. You mentioned Cheeseman Park and we have Alamo Placita. We have these amazing parks, Congress Park, um, within our district. But what is the value of a park if I can't go running it in it without choking on the air? Um, you know, my family's from New York. I live very close to the Bronx. I've seen what happens when the quality of air goes low. You start having folks born with lung issues very early on with pulmonary issues um, and more. And so I think we need to be addressing that as well. And that affects not just District 10, but the entire city writ large. Um, as far as the rest of the, the facts that you gave there, I think some of that has to do with wealth. Right? As I mentioned earlier, it's an incredibly wealthy part of the district. And so um, not shockingly, those who have more um, wealth often have better health outcomes. I think you'll see in other parts of the city where that might not be the case, um, some pretty dramatic drops in those numbers. Um, as far as the obesity, and, I, and then I'll turn it over to Chris, uh, you know, it's interesting, 50 years ago, Denver, well, let's start here. Right now, Denver is the least obese state in the country. 50 years ago, as compared to today, we'd be the most obese state in the country. Um, so this has just been nationwide. You've seen obesity levels rise. So I think we need to do more with um, physical fitness, with good eating, et cetera, to address the issue. So um, District 10 is the most affluent district, or uh, yeah, the most affluent district in the city. It has um, Cherry Creek, it has Country Club, and those are um, two very wealthy neighborhoods. And with wealth comes access, and um, access to, uh, to humidifiers, access to air purifiers, access to fresh and healthy food um, that can be delivered. Um, so that I can understand why um, our average age might be a little bit higher in District 10 relative to other areas. Um, Capitol Hill is 60%, more than 60% millennial. Um, so to, you mentioned tobacco use is higher in, in District 10. I would imagine it's predominantly in Cap Hill. And, um, and it really is a tale of two cities, um, District 10, in that there's um, you know, Cherry Creek and Country Club, and then there's um, Cap Hill. There's another area of the district where um, we have people who um, are young, they're in crippling amounts of student loan debt, um, they can't afford a car, um, and, uh, and the reason they live in Cap Hill is because that's the only place they can find a, a, a roof over their heads, and the place is 100 years old, it doesn't have a dishwasher, it doesn't have an air conditioner, and, um, and so you know, the air quality is even more important to them because they can't clean the air. But, um, but I, I recognize that as a district, um, we are overall better off than, than the majority of districts. How do we mobilize the resources of District 10 for the city. When you're on council, if you're on council, uh, the work you're doing is not specifically just for your district, mm -hmm. right? You have a goal of developing it and maintaining it and whatnot, but you're voting on issues that affect everybody. You talk about air quality, and we know that District 9 has one of the most polluted zip codes in America, mm -hmm. right? And we know that they're burning methane right off the top, and we all go outside and breathe it. Air doesn't just stay in District 9. Agreed. Travel. So to the question of how do we work together, how do we mobilize resources, what are, gonna do? Uh, what are you gonna do? Sure, so transboundary harm like you're talking about, it happens. Um, I think recycling and mandatory recycling is something the city needs to look into. Mandatory recycling for businesses that pollute at a higher rate than any other group. I think that's one of the things that would really improve things in District 9, but citywide, uh, I think it's so important. So I think it's really unfortunate that we're missing two of the, na uh, two of the people who are on the ballot because, um, cause he and I agree on a lot of stuff, but what can de specifically the city council person in District 10 do? Can be a champion. Um, uh, you know, the, with, because we have, um, uh, we have some affluency, we can actually, um, and, and it's generally a, a pretty liberal district. Um, and what we don't have right now is we don't have a champion in District 10 to fight to sponsor legislation that does recycling, to sponsor legislation that says we're gonna uh, go 100% renewable by 2030, we're, to sponsor legislation that says um, we're gonna look into biofuels as, as opposed to um, fossil fuels. And, um, and that's something that we're really missing as, um, as an opportunity for a District 10 representative. Do you have anything to add? No, I think, that, I think we're all agree. You both seem to agree on this topic. And I think that's important. 
Um, in the area surrounding I-70 in Swansea, Elyria, and Globeville, families have been subject to multi-generational health effects from living near two highways with a Superfund site. Uh, a study came out, posted in The Guardian, that said that 71% of climate change is predicated on 100 companies. Out of those, 99 are oil and gas, uh, which is a major contributor to our own situation. You mentioned 2030. Our governor has a plan in place. You mentioned 2030. Guilty. Mr. Hines, good work. Um, it's important because that is the date that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change set for irreversible, catastrophic, we might as a species cease to exist, right, level. When our governor has said that 2040 is his date for transitioning Colorado to renewables. Uh, you want to be a champion. How do we, what do we do? I mean, there's, there's got to be more. When you say you're going to be a champion, who are you going to fight? What are you going to fight for? What? Yeah. So I've already taken the no fossil fuel money pledge. I haven't taken a single dollar from fossil fuel companies. I've already taken the pledge that, um, that if it, uh, state law allows, which they're considering, oh, no, the, the governor passed and signed, mm -hmm. um, that um, if I'm on council, I will vote to, um, to ban fracking in Denver. Obviously, I don't have authority beyond Denver's boundaries. I do have a lot of relationships at the state level, like he does as well, and would use those relationships to, um, to move to curtail fossil fuels beyond, um, beyond our boundaries. But certainly, within Denver City Council, um, no more fracking. Um, I, um, I think that we need to get out of our cars as well. And so I have on my website, and I've talked many times about the idea of a 20 minute neighborhood, as in every neighborhood should have everything needed to th the thrive, uh, food, fresh and healthy food, um, access to a uh, grocery store, and you know, all, all the things you need within a 20 minute walk. Um, frankly, I was on Blueprint, I stole it from Blueprint, but I don't feel bad because they stole it from the 1950s. Um, so, um, so it's important for us to, uh, to get out of our cars. That's one thing that we can do. Um, and as a city, we can nurture that. We can nurture our uh, pedestrian infrastructure by fixing our busted and broken sidewalks. We can install a, a um, uh, protected bite link network. And, um, and that helps community as well. It makes sure that we can come together and we get out of our cars and we meet each other and we, uh, we have the community. And then we can work together as a community to fight against fracking, fossil fuels, and um, on all this environmental harm that we have uh, continued to do to our own country, or our own planet, rather. Mr. Mendez? Sure, and I think Chris started talking about this, but I really want to put the exclamation point on it. So transportation is incredibly important. So right now, 73% of us commute to work in our car by ourselves. We are polluting our country and our, and our planet. Um, we need to do more to expand bus service, um, to make it affordable, reliable, and frequent. You know, uh, I have lived in several different states. I've had learner's permits in four. Uh, Colorado is the first place I got my license because this is a state you cannot live in without having a license, unfortunately. Um, I've seen a lot of folks talk about rail and transportation and the, the need for more regional rail. I think that's important, but let's get our buses working so folks don't feel the need to drive to work. Uh, it, to me, it's kind of sad that the regional bus systems are so much better than the uh, local bus systems. So the Boulder, the Flatiron Flyer, um, the bus thing that goes down to Colorado Springs, these are excellent buses. But unfortunately, our RTD buses just don't do enough and it's the most expensive ticket in the country, which bars access for low-income folks. So I think we need to do more around that that will actually help a ton with pollution. Thanks. Excellent. I think we're ready for the last question. Okay. Anything mine or yours? Mine, I think. Go for it. <laughs> so a topic near our hearts here, media is in crisis in Colorado. Denver Open Media, our host this evening, is under attack. As Mayor Hancock has worked to defund this important public access media project and remove equipment. The Denver Post and the Daily Camera, our region's only two major print newspapers are owned by hedge funds who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff. Fake news is the slur of the day, thanks to our president. How do, you, how do we support our local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that work to be a pillar in our community, uh, providing information, providing equal access, educational programs, and media training to everyone? Let's start with you, Mr. Hines. Um, so our fourth estate is critical. Um, I, as someone who's looking to be an elected official, uh, we need to have our elected officials accountable. And, um, and one way that we can have that accountability is through the press. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's critical. I actually 
um, did some freelance work for the Dallas Morning News and for the, uh, the Dallas Observer, which is the equivalent of the Westward here. Um, so I uh, appreciate our, um, our press. We need to make sure that it is properly funded. Um, I, I think it's a travesty that, um, that our press in Colorado, our, our paper of record is owned by a private equity firm and th that cares about profitability and as opposed to uh, making sure that we um, are informed as, as citizens in our, in our state. Um, I don't know exactly how to uh, tell private companies what to do. I would say that Colorado Public Radio is thriving. Um, they, just, uh, they just acquired Denverite. And, um, and so I, I'm happy to do whatever it, um, whatever it takes to make sure that we have uh, the appropriate resources for, um, for frankly, to, uh, for people to hold me accountable. Mr. Mendez. So I'll start off by disclaiming that I've worked with Open Media Foundation before. Special shout out to Brandon and Giorgio. You guys are awesome. Um, I will say I'm completely in favor of protecting Open Media Foundation. I think it's a travesty that the mayor is trying to defund it. I'm sure, I hope that that's an oversight on his part and not something that's intentionally being done because of whatever coverage or criticism of the mayor. Um, I agree with Chris that it's difficult to determine how we fix the Denver Post or those issues. I'm um, given that it is a capitalist system where they're owned by someone. I think the Colorado Sun is an interesting idea of folks coming together and bringing up their own newspaper. To me, that's that grassroots work that has always worked. Um, but yeah, I think the, the role of city council in the Open Media Foundation issue is definitely to protect it. I see less of the ability to do that with the Denver Post, other than galvanizing maybe some local leaders to potentially purchase it from said hedge fund. And I feel like local leaders have a vested interest in that paper way more so than someone in New York or someone in DC. May I say please. Yes, please. So I think it's really important for, uh, you know, how, how are we, we have someone in the audience who doesn't even know whether um, any candidate in District 10 deserves her vote. And that's, that's horrible. I mean, that's, and part of that's because we don't have the press to give, you know, to, to spread the word. Like, I'm really sad that there hasn't been more coverage on the District 10 race. Um, and, and frankly, that's part of, you know, part of the reason, you know, part, Part of the reason why that happens is the exact same question you're asking. So we definitely need, citizens need increased access to information and the press is here to give it to us, so. To your uh, question about Hancock's possible oversight or whether it was an intentional move, in 2018, Denver's Department of Marketing and Media Services under Mayor Hancock uh, moved control of Denver's public access channels to the city uh, resulting in the city essentially co-opting control of media and content from the public. Uh, government control of public access is, uh, here in Denver, it, it strikes me as insane because it sounds way too much like Donald Trump saying that we should have a state-run news channel which parrots North Korea or Russia, right? And that's happening under our current mayor. Uh, so, I mean, more and more power has been shifted to the mayor's office in recent years, including this. It's too much power centered in the mayor's office. Uh, as city council persons, what can you do to take back control and expand public access? Yeah, we currently have a strong mayor system in Denver, and I don't mean that as in the mayor is strong, but rather that's a type of governance, strong mayor, and then there's a weak mayor type. Um, I, I have said openly in the Denver Post, actually, that I'm against this, um, and that I think that city council should have more control. I think it's going to take a unified move on the part of city council, which is incredibly difficult to try to get all those folks to agree on any one thing. Um, but I do think that if uh, under with the right representation, we could pull some power back. But I do think that folks need to elect in the right folks who are brave enough and courageous enough to do that. Um, I think the mayor probably won't be happy with the idea that power is being taken away from them. Yeah, I would say two things. First of all, you can decide on or before May 7th who controls city council and you can decide um, who has the power to either check the mayor or not. And so, um, you know, think about that as you, as you cast your vote and, um, and consider if you want someone who's going to agree with the mayor 90 something percent of the time or if you want someone who's going to call BS on the mayor from time to time. Um, the second thing is um, we have term limits um, at, on city council and in the mayor's office. Um, I've talked with uh, former city council officials 
who have said that there are things that the city council can do under the charter as it is today that it isn't doing. So um, I, I haven't done the research on the charter and Denver Open Media, but, um, but it seems odd to me that, um, that the mayor could just take it from, uh, from the city council. And, um, and I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't done all the research, but I'd be very interested to see how this fits under the charter and if it is possible for city council to say, no, we want it back. And I think uh, you know, that's something definitely that we could investigate after May 7th or June 4th. Excellent. Um, that is the conclusion of uh, the major body of our questions. How are we all feeling? Good. Feeling good? Lightning round. Feeling comfortable, feeling safe? Because it's about to get fast, you guys. <laughs> fast. We're gonna yell, we're gonna yell things at you, and hopefully you have the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is, only they can decide. The audience. Fair. The citizens of District 10. Good. All right. Do you wanna start? Sure. So Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD in the city. For or against? Four. Four. Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Denver is voting on decriminalizing mushrooms. The psilocybin initiative legalized mushrooms, yes or no? Yes. No. <laughs> State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes, do you support rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes, yes. Do you support deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA? Yes, always, yes. The Olympics initiative prohibiting the use of public money's resources or fiscal guarantees in connection with any future Olympic games without the city first obtaining voter approval for or against? For voter approval, let Denver vote. April 10th was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay, yes or no? Yes, yes. Ban fracking in Colorado, yes or no? No. We don't have the authority to do that, so no. Democracy for the People Act would ban corporations and other entities from donating directly to candidates, lower contribution limits, and create matching funds, officially bringing campaign finance reform to Denver and blunting the impact of money in politics. Did you support 2E, yes or no? Yes. Yes. And finally, ending with some important geopolitical intrigue. Gentlemen, who will win the Game of Thrones? <laughs> Daenerys. Oh. No idea. No oh, idea. Oh, you don't gosh. watch it. Well, oh my god. Yes. Well, I guess we know who's not winning the race. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. That was a joke. I'm yeah. being facetious. Yeah, Gentlemen, yeah. thank you for participating. Uh, at this time, we would like to ask each of you to give one and a half to two minute uh, closing statement before we conclude. Uh, who do we start with? So let's start with Mr. Mendez. Sure. Hi, my name is Antonio Mendez, and I'm a candidate for Denver City Council District 10. Uh, I'm the son of two immigrant parents who immigrated to this country from the Dominican Republic. They started off working in box factories and button factories to make a living, but ultimately graduated from Columbia University School of Social Work. My parents taught me from a young age that education and hard work pay off in this country. Um, because of that, I worked hard. I got a scholarship to go to Colby College. And after that, I was a Teach for America teacher in Newark, New Jersey to give back to communities like mine um, that needed support. Uh, after Colby, I worked for the Posse Foundation, empowering a new group of leaders uh, to go out and seek higher education. Um, after that, I was proud to be selected uh, as one of five representatives from our country to the co-principality of Andorra. Um, I came back to this country, and like so many before me, uh, I head west. Uh, looking for opportunity. You know, God made me a New Yorker, but opportunity made me a Coloradan. I spent uh, four wonderful years with the Hickenlooper administration working on policy at the highest level. Uh, I've spent uh, my time since then working as executive director of Serve Colorado. That's the Governor's Commission on Community Service. Uh, you know, I live here, I work here, and in 2017, me and my wife got married here. Uh, I'm looking to build a Denver for the next 20 years, a Denver that's equitable, a Denver that provides access for everyone. I think it's incredibly important uh, for your vote to think about who is being really represented. Is it just the wealthy few, the wealthy elite, one neighborhood, or is it the entire district? And does that person have the experience necessary to start that work on day one? 
Thank you. Please vote for me, Antonio Mendez. Mr. Hines. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for tuning in and, um, and hearing the no BS debate. Um, I'm Chris Hines, candidate for Denver City Council's District 10, and I'm so excited that you are paying attention, that you're watching, that you're informed. That is the most important part of our, our political processes for us to show up, get informed, and vote. Um, it is it's critical for our democracy. Um, I, uh, as I'd mentioned, I'm running on three things. I'm, uh, I want to make sure that we all, all have access to housing. I used to say we were in an affordable housing crisis. We're just in a housing crisis at this point. Um, we all need access to transportation. Um, we're expecting an additional 200,000 people to move to the city of Denver by 2040. We have to move beyond our cars because we can't fit another 200,000 cars in our parking. We can't fit another 200,000 cars on our streets. Um, Colorado is already a parking lot. I think they should charge for parking on Colorado, our eastern border of District 10. And, um, uh, and so we need to think beyond, uh, beyond our cars, our single occupant vehicles, and think about that 20 minute neighborhood that I talked about. And we all deserve access to, our, uh, to representation. Um, it's in the title, after all, a representative is supposed to represent us. And uh, so like what Antonio had mentioned, we need someone who's gonna stand up, be a champion for uh, District 10, but also be a champion for Denver, who's gonna make sure that we lead on issues such as climate change uh, or uh, mitigating the effects of climate change. And so I'm Chris Hines. I would love to have your vote and your support. Thank you. Chris. Hines and Antonio Mendez, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your stance on some of Denver's most pressing issues. Uh, we wish you the best during your race. Um, and we also would like to thank the audience for being here tonight and showing up and being informed citizens um, as you all head to the polls. Remember that the change that you seek in your community begins with you. It begins with your voice and your vote. So, so definitely get out there and vote. Um, we'd also like to thank the Denver Open Media and Open Media Foundation, as well as Civic Matters, for hosting tonight's event. I'm Sarah Ali. And I'm Della Vaca. Um, thank you so much, and have a wonderful evening.